So this is uh, our next installment of what we've put together affectionately as the, the COVID panel, pulling together several surgeons from across the country and in different neighborhoods to talk about what's going on. We did several of these over the course of March, April, May, and many of those you can look at the recordings. They're on the APSA website. And we, we decided that with things that have changed, that it was, that it was time to do this again. And many people that are in discussions and committees around, around the country are hearing new challenges and different things. So we wanted to put this together. So we pulled together another all-star panel. I'll start just real quick, just to introduce Martha, if you want to say, Martha is our, our uh, research resident that's been working on the Google Sheets. Hi, everyone. I'm Martha Ingram. I'm a general surgery resident at Emory University in Atlanta, doing my research um, scholar years at Lurie Children's in Chicago. And um, I've been working with the quality and safety committee members with the COVID-19. Great. And then let's just go around and everybody just say who you are and, and where you are and what role you play. My name is Kojin Sao. I'm a pediatric surgeon at uh, UT Houston. Our main hospital is Children's Memorial Herman Hospital. I'll give you a little context. We're a children's hospital within a hospital. Uh, so we've got a large adult component to it, but it's about probably 250 beds of, of pediatrics. Hey y'all, I'm uh, Lee, pediatric surgeon at uh, UCSF. Chris Newton's partner, although he's mostly over in Oakland and I'm mostly over in San Francisco as we have two children's hospitals. Just of note, the Oakland uh, campus is a freestanding children's hospital, whereas the uh, San Francisco uh, campus is a women and children's uh, hospital that also um, has a cancer component, and we're part of the big uh, UCSF uh, medical center. Bob Letton just moved to Jacksonville, Florida, about a year and a half ago. Uh, work uh, at a it's 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 contained in a complex, but it's freestanding. But it is you know kind of a, what happens on the adult side can can obviously affect the the kids side. You know, depending on bed status and stuff like that during surges and things. So, but we are a freestanding children's hospital, about 250 beds as well. I am Monica Lopez. I'm a pediatric surgeon at Texas Children's Hospital. I'm neighbors with Cogen Sal. Our hospital is a uh, freestanding children's hospital. We're both in the city of Houston. So I think hopefully we can offer complimentary views. Well, and, and we know that Houston uh, over the past couple months has had some you know particular challenges, which is part of the motivation of getting both of you here. Let me set up kind of the first bit of the discussion with, as we said in March, April, May timeframe, the initial waves of the pandemic hit every part of the country a little bit differently. Life for everybody changed what we did in the OR, how we scheduled patients, how we educated our residents, uh, how we took care of our families was, was chaos. Stating the obvious, there came a point where some things calmed down, some things got better. And, and then last month in you know, July and some in June, around the country, a lot of communities had increases in numbers again. So the, the feared second surge where uh, things were not over. The environment, however, in most uh, hospitals and most communities was one in which everyone was trying to get back to normalcy trying to do elective cases, catch up on case backlogs, try to right the ship financially for the hospitals, and then the numbers go up. And I know from many discussions I've had, this created real complex and new challenges. And, uh, and, this, is, and this is kind of the motivation behind getting this group together. So I wanna go around and have everybody comment locally on what's happened in the hospital, particularly with the, the second wave effects and how you guys dealt with that and, and the balance of doing the cases and the financial pressures and also the COVID protection, which was a real problem. So, and let me, uh, uh, let me begin with, you know, with the Houston uh, contingent. So Kojin and Monica, why don't we start with Kojin and you guys can comment about what you have you guys experienced last month? I think, you know, I probably maybe Monica had a different experience. Um, when the first uh, portion hit, everybody essentially shut down. We stopped elective surgeries. We up uh, ramped all of our ICU capacities and whatnot. And I do think there was a significant impact on the hospital from that activity. Diagnostic testing was down, imaging was down, everything was down. 
um, I think that that obviously became probably a bigger impact than what most folks thought it would be, uh, especially not knowing when that was going to end. So when the opportunity from the state came to sort of reopen, uh, we had a graduated sort of approach, probably like a lot of people did, of bringing cases back. I think we reached a fairly steady state of sort of elective surgery. Uh, it was probably less than 50% capacity. Families probably didn't want to come back as much as we didn't want to do certain elective operations just like everybody else. But when we saw the second surge, I think that's where we felt a big impact from the adult side. So we are fairly connected, even though we're kind of in separate buildings. And the adult site became very busy. I think at one point we were probably 160 uh, COVID patients in the hospital on the adult side. Um, the ICU was um, pretty high capacity as well. We had probably 10 patients on adult patients on ECMO, a couple of pediatric patients. So um, it got pretty busy for, I think, about three or four weeks. What we did in turn from our side was we had to uh, offload a lot of the capacity of the adults. So we ended up upsizing our age to 25. So we were taking 25 year olds onto general pediatrics. And then as the pediatric surgeons, we would be their general surgeons for those as well. We uh, increased our trauma age. Uh, we were 16 and under, we went up to 18 to offload the capacity from, from that standpoint. And, and as a service, a pediatric surgery service, we certainly felt that we had many kind of older, young adult patients in the ICU, trauma pattern that we didn't typically take care of. And so I think that was uh, a big strain on our system. And uh, even though we planned and planned, I don't think that people can anticipate sort of that high acuity. So it wasn't necessarily the COVID patients that we were getting on the pediatric side, but it was sort of the general trauma, the general emissions and whatnot, because we're such a, a tight partnership with the, with the adult ORs. And did, did that impact, and, and I'll let Monica get in here, but I'm really curious. So the overflow of the different age into the pediatric resources, did you then for the kids, for the pediatrics, that clearly impacted what you could do? So you canceled elective cases and stopped doing yeah, we were not doing any elective cases that had a potential for ICU admission. I think that was still across the board uh, true. I think from a general elective, we never really ramped up that high. I do think that we um, are pretty close to um, almost capacity now, uh, but the volume certainly still is, is down and there's sort of backlog, at least in general surgery, uh, that is. And, and now we're running into school. And so a lot of the elective stuff probably isn't gonna happen. And, and again, I think patients don't necessarily want to come. We had a lot of sort of capacity expansion that we needed uh, to do, and uh, I think we handled it fairly well. We're kind of on the downslope of that surge now. Um, we've kind of gone back to normal age groups, but we were probably three or four weeks, we were really ramped up the um, age capacity for us. Monica, do you guys have the same experience? Yeah, it's very similar. You know, UT Memorial Hermann and Texas Children's are part of the Texas Medical Center, and I have to say they've had a really well-coordinated data monitoring of all the cases and other trends for the whole TMC. And so it was nice to have that as a, an additional layer of information as the various institutions had to come up with individualized schemes for how to deal with things. I think that was helpful. And had this very similar response Bonds are so initially the special isolation unit is located uh, on the west campus, which is a, a separate campus from the the main. However, very rapidly we had to adapt to open some of the ICU floors at the main hospital because very soon that SIU was completely full. We observed the same patterns with regards to increased trauma. We already had, uh, would take up to 18 years of age patients regardless, but we were getting older patients and similarly had adult patients and currently still have adult patients on, on ECMO and had to uh, do operations on COVID positive kids, but also COVID, COVID positive adults. The elective side of things, we, at this point actually was a, it was a great effort I think to try and get things uh, situated so that to make it safe for everybody to still continue but it was a fine balance and we're up to 80 percent of our pre 80 percent of the activity uh, compared to pre-COVID 
And the way we've done that is just, it's been a challenge because there's been limiting factors such as limited staffing, for example, to run operating rooms. Some of the staff were not available or had limited hours as um, other mechanisms to deal with the financial uh, impact of the whole thing. And so, but we nevertheless have been able to continue that and have a really robust in-house testing for screening all these patients who all need to do it within 40 hours of surgery through our various drive-through type mechanisms um, around the hospital. And yes, we have had to cancel several, a good proportion of elective surgeries based on those results because we feel like, again, once we see that, it's, it's a lot of these cases do not need to be done and it's not safe to do so. Yeah. Um, but we have proceeded with urgent, with oncology cases, et cetera. And just the elective side of things, we continue to, you know, things to be able to do. And, and again, a lot of families are reluctant, but we're trying our best to keep everybody safe. They do require universal masking in the hospital uh, and the pre-op testing that I mentioned. And the only single healthy adult needs to come in with their child if they're going to be in the hospital building for any reason. Yeah. And for the recovery as well. So that limits what kind of um, surgeries we can do or that families are wanting to do. And, and I'm guessing you, you guys had, I think, maybe the unique experience of having your pediatric infrastructure caring for older, you know, older patients uh, up to 25. And I'm interested if you have any advice or lessons learned. I, I'm guessing ICU and residents or fellows or whoever was, was stepping up to the plate embraced that role. You know, was there special training or did you said, go do it? <laughs> I think embracing is a little generous. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it's a challenge. I think us as pediatric surgeons that have had a history of taking care of adults, you know, that transition is, is not so daunting. But I think for a pediatric hospital where most of the folks don't have the adult training, I think there's a lot of things that sort of need to be addressed, not just from sort of policies and procedures, but just logistics you know, be able to move patients physically, transport, things like that. I think it's a challenge uh, when you're not accustomed to doing that. So I think we're lucky to have a very good adult partner. And I think they recognize uh, what the Children's Hospital is doing for them to offset, offset some of the um, patient burden. So we did have a lot of crosstalk and a lot of partnership to kind of drive some of those things. But it's still the staff is the staff, you know, and it's still the pediatric nursing and RTs and all that that are just not accustomed to grown men and women um, in your yeah. children's hospital. I think it's tough. Pharmacy, I mean, all kinds of, you know, layers of staffing that has to be accounted for. But I totally agree with Kojan. We did it the same way. We relied heavily on our partnership with the Baylor adult general surger, surgeons, having routine conversations with them about these patients' eligibility for adult patients on ECMO, what to do during a run, things like that. And that I think we expand on the um, previous relationship we had with them because they would offer general surgery coverage to the pavilion for women, who is a separate uh, wing of this children's hospital. And so for a long time, we had good relationships with them for that and other subspecialty coverage, uh, for example, vascular surgery. So I think uh, relying on that and trying to do the best as a team is really what worked. Hey, Bob, how did, how were you guys impacted in Florida? Similarly with, uh, you know, March, April, May, the, you know, everything was pretty much shut down. Although Pete surgery stayed, you know, pretty consistently busy because our practice is mostly inpatient anyway. So we were still operating a fair amount during that time. The governor released the gag order second week of May by about the third to fourth week of May we were fired back up. The outpatient side actually, you know, is, is running fairly consistent and fairly smoothly because uh, we can get them tested fairly uh, adequately. And we did not see quite the surge in our, our partner adult hospital that perhaps Herman and Baylor saw. So there was not ever real, I mean, we were prepared to kind of do the same things, but there was never really a threat with that coming our way, but we did limit, we, we have been limiting like spines and things like that that might need a PICU bed 
you know, post-op and stuff, just any elective stuff, just in case. It looks like, if you look at our numbers, and sounds like in Houston as well, we're starting to see that uh, inpatient curve come down. And so hopefully that will continue. You know, our biggest, and it's interesting because if you look at ENT and some of the other divisions, they were like, you know, a couple of thousand cases behind. And I would say at least half of those, when we called to reschedule the self-quarantining isolation, all of a sudden the otitis got better and the strep throat got better. And, you know, it was amazing how many, uh, especially in ENT, I mean, it was just amazing how many BMTs and TNAs and, and all of that just said, hey, we don't need it anymore. So we're actually fairly, you know, we've been going since, uh, since probably, we've been fired up since June, probably. We're, we're actually relatively caught up on our backlog, except for uh, urology still got a little bit to go and, and ENT, but we're actually further ahead on, on that than we suspected. And like you said, school's getting ready to start. So there's going to be a second sort of wave of COVID probably, but also a second sort of reason they're not going to want to do surgery now because school's starting back up and, um, and things. Our biggest issue sharing resources with the adult side has been our inpatient stuff. It's like, you know, you pull into the parking deck and it says there's three spaces left or whatever on the board. You know, we, we got a thing like that for how many tests we have for today. We've just run out of testing. So basically uh, any appy or whatever that comes through the door, we have to treat it as a PUI right now. We do the, uh, take the patient to, we have a COVID designated room anesthesia and the nurse go in, intubate the patient. That room circulates in 15 minutes so nobody else can go in the room for 15 minutes. Then you can, uh, you know, it's recommended to wear N95 or whatever, even after the 15 minutes, but we don't enforce that so much. We do the case, then the patient has to extubate in the room, wake up there, go back to the room on the floor, then that's 45 minutes of a terminal clean after that case. So you can well imagine four appies can take you 12 hours to get done just purely because we've run out of tests in a lot of Florida. I mean, it's, you know, the surge came and every hospital's fighting for the same reagent, the same swabs and the same uh, this and that. We do have uh, our own internal machine that's a new machine coming next week, I hope, that's supposed to alleviate some of this, but that's a four-hour test. So we still We'll have to wait four hours, you know, which kind of just you adapt to it. But, you know, it used to be we, we, we had gotten happies to an outpatient process. Right. I mean, they get the ER, we take them to the OR and, and send them home. Now it, uh, it's, it's a little different on, on some of that stuff. So uh, the world is the world has changed. We're dealing with it. I'm, I'm glad that I didn't have to put any adults on ECMO or practice my uh, adult general surgical skills uh, through it. Uh, it's not over yet. So I've been paying attention to what happened in Houston because we're Florida. We're, we're, we're bad boys. You know, we got sheriffs uh, outlawing uh, people from wearing masks and stuff here in the state. So, um, you know, it's, it's not over. So. Hey, what's the time frame of your testing challenges? Is this just within the past few weeks? Uh, it kind of been a roller coaster the whole time. I mean, you know, we, we'll get a load and have like a thousand tests, and then three days later we're at zero. And yeah, you know, we have the rapid test, but that's pretty limited. I, I don't know. Some decisions maybe could have made been made a little differently, but it's it, again, it's a supply and demand thing. There are a number of let's see here. There's there's a number of major you know national hospital chains uh, in town. And, you know, they can kind of circulate things around, you know, from state to state, depending on supply and demand, like Mayo, you know, uh, Rochester sent just about every test they had down here when the surge came through Florida so that they could, t you know, so we're a nice big regional chain, but we don't have that national connection. So our ability to move things around to where they're needed uh, were difficult. And that just really, I mean, it's like every day it's okay. Are we on the, we can test today protocol or we are on everybody's a PUI. I mean, it's, 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 it's fun. My, that's a challenge. I'm, I'm so sorry. Let me ask you one question because we were ultimately planning on getting to this. I'll, I'll let you answer. Okay. You know, is with all the PUIs and the changes that you've made, how's your staff been in, impacted? So have you had 
you know, staff members and, you know, or, or some of your team that turned positive? We've, yeah, we've had a couple, but we really, um, I mean, they, we really preemptively struck with, you're going to wear a mask, you're going to wear a goggle, you know, it, uh, we, we pretty much treated everybody who was not tested as if they were positive. We've had a couple of, we, we've not had to limit yet, we've not had to limit any of our ORs or anything because of that. But yeah, we've had some staff positive. You know, I, I'm really interested, me personally, and, and the other people can say what's happening there, but I'm really interested in them giving me the antibody test so I can see how much IgM I got floating around to this uh, COVID thing. Because I'm pretty sure, you know, we're, we're pretty immune to some of this stuff as pediatric surgeons because we've been exposed to these coronaviruses, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, for for life, I mean, I, there, I just don't see how I have not picked it up or I'm not carrying it with with as much COVID positive patient surgery as I've done. But of you know, it'd be interested to I'm interested to hear what the others would say as well with respect to antibody testing and the physicians and whether that would be of any benefit or not. Hanman, you want to comment about the Bay Area and and uh, please feel free to speak about you know all the campuses. Sure. Uh, so. I think in the Bay Area, we had sort of a mild increase in cases uh, back in March. Um, we obviously, along with everybody else in the country, prepared for the worst, but our health system, I think, peaked at around the high 20s in terms of numbers of patient in our whole hospital chain in um, the early part of the uptick. It affected us by having to be prepared. Um, we didn't really have much of adult patients that we had to really take care of, although we had to clear capacity. We went down to about 30% uh, of surgical volume in the children's hospitals and gradually, like everybody else, uh, in a graduated fashion, increased that. I would say, interestingly, like some of the other comments that were made, some of the cases just kind of disappeared. I think that they disappeared because kids were no longer getting into as many accidents. They disappeared because kids weren't getting infected virally and um, bacterially. And uh, they also disappeared because some people lost health insurance. And finally, some people just didn't want to come in for some routine things. And I'm very interested to see long term how this affects uh, how people think about healthcare. Are we gonna have more people that just never get epigastric and umbilical hernias fixed? Is some of scoliosis just gonna be treated more with braces? Same thing with pectus, carinatum, and excavatum. Uh, I think that's a really unknown thing. Are we going to become more like, you know, the Brits or other countries where they just sort of accept uh, some types of conditions? In the second phase, our health system saw, again, a sort of modest uptick, certainly compared to Florida and Texas, where we, I think, peaked at around 40 uh, patients in our health system. So nothing like the 150 uh, or so that Kojin was talking about or the you know, basically three to 600 that some of the New York hospitals saw. But again, we had to sort of, you know, think about clearing capacity. I think one thing that uh, we've seen is, is that we were back to about pre-COVID volumes in terms of numbers of cases, but we never saw the summer surge. Typically in the summers, we see about a 15 to 20% increase over the rest of the years with elective surgery. And now that we're back to school, we never saw that. We were at or close to um, pre-COVID volumes, but never saw that 15 to 20% um, surge. I think one thing that this has all highlighted is communication, however. You know, because we have two children's hospitals, we had to coordinate closely between the two, as you know. Being part of a big health system, we also had to coordinate with the adult side of our enterprise, which, you know, really is much bigger than the children's side of things, obviously. And then I think the other thing that's been very beneficial is to communicate with our colleagues across the country in forums like this through uh, APSA, as you lead the disaster preparedness uh, network, uh, and also, also through the Children's Hospital Association. Um, there's a weekly children, um, surgeon in chief meeting uh, and I think all those forums have been really helpful in disseminating information and learning from each other. And so I think that communication, and certainly even within our own division, we've increased our communication substantially. 
that obviously does come at some cost because I feel like, I, you know, like probably like everybody in this uh, meeting and all of our APSA members, you know, it feels like um, I have meetings sort of nonstop uh, every day. Uh, but I think that that has really had a, a huge benefit in just communicating and learning from each other. So I think that that's been a really uh, great thing and, and not just in COVID, but in other areas. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you brought up the, you know, kind of the newly developed or evolved infrastructure and networks of, of people talking to each other. It's, um, and as you pointed out, it's a little bit of a mixed blessing. It's a, it's a challenge to keep up with it, but it's also, I think, really amazing where it's, where it's come to. And you, you kind of mentioned a little bit of this, but getting into kind of the next realm of discussion points of, especially with Surge, how has things impacted specific patient care and, and uh, algorithms and what we're doing. And in particular, I'm interested in have things changed permanently? And so in, in focusing on, on patients, you know, are we, is telemedicine here to stay? Are we going to be testing kids permanently? You know, are we always going to be doing N95 masks from now on for, you know, high risk procedures? Has our systems protected the kids the other way around? Have we had kids that turned positive because they, they just did? And, you know, they were at risk. Let me ask you, Monica, uh, you know, to, we'll go around and I'll, I'll come back, Hanman, and let you answer as well. I do think some of those things will forever be part of how we deliver care, um, specifically for telemedicine. What we're doing now, I mean, in-person clinic, we're obviously still doing, but in order to preserve the physical distancing and the common areas for families and all that are our, our in-person clinics, the templates have changed so that they're literally one patient every 30 minutes, much more slow in terms of the progression of your clinic and the number of patients you can fit in. So we are relying heavily on telemedicine to really maintain uh, access and man maintain um, the availability of, of patients coming in for, to, be see, to be seen. I think that has its challenges. Mm, I, I am wondering whether we're, you know, for a group of patients with digital literacy problems with access to a phone or Wi-Fi is, is going to be a problem in the long term. And we're going to exacerbate some inequities in access that we had hoped to get rid of. But um, I think that is one area where I, I foresee that I think we will continue to have to do it this way for a while. Let me ask as well, with, with all the precautions that, that you've seen, did, did, you guys, did you guys have patients that Ciro converted, you know, in the hospital? Mm, anecdotally, but not, not a big proportion. Not and, what, and, the, and in those situations, it turned out when we did the investigations that I, I guess the patient had um it wasn't really a continuous hospital stay so they went back out to the community and i think we're just with the high community transmission we had attributed to that right but i'm sure it's possible i've heard of others who have encountered that more frequently right and and i guess it, you know and i ask this because it's what i think we all fear and uh and no one's quite sure uh how much it's happening and and you know how much we can reassure families and yeah. Our hearts want to say, yes, it's fine. It's okay. But I, I know we all worry about it. So yes. Kojin, you want to, you want to comment on, on patient issues and stuff that's permanent and have kids gotten impacted? I think there's probably some good things that have come out of this, things that we've always struggled with. I think hand hygiene is pretty ingrained. Wear eye protection in the operating room, which no one really hardly ever did routinely. I think those are hopefully part of us and we'll continue to do that. I'm not terribly offended by wearing a mask in the hospital. You know, I think you, know, you probably have practitioners with colds uh, without a mask on. So I do think there's some safety practices for us that hopefully will be kind of ingrained in the system and we won't necessarily. I do think one of the challenges that we have always struggled with is the health team, the healthcare providers, and the rules have kind of changed and the guidelines have changed. And so when uh, the docs or the nurses test positive, you know, what got them back to work, it was two negative tests, 40 hours apart. And, you know, we had residents that were out six weeks until they tested negative. And now we're following the CDC guidelines about uh, 10 days asymptomatic. And so I'm sure like a lot of folks, we've encountered patients that are completely asymptomatic that have tested positive. 
And so now we've instilled uh, policies where they can, you know, have their surgery in, uh, within 10 days and not have to be retested. You know, those are kind of real logistic issues. Just like every other hospital, we have patients that come from afar. They can't get pre-tested, you know, a day or two before. And so now you're talking about having access to testing the day of and how do you schedule those. And, and we think of surgery, it's a big thing, but, you know, the same kind of policies were in place for imaging and endoscopy with GI, some of the more routine things. So I think going through this, I think we've learned to sort of streamline, hopefully in a safe way, what needs or can be done uh, to help take care of the patients and get the healthcare teams back to a uh, higher functioning capacity in the health system uh, within your hospital. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think to some degree, I mean, I, I, I can't see... Uh... You know, once COVID goes away, the next one's out there. And I think we've learned that lesson maybe finally in social distancing and how we're, you know, checking patients into the clinic and how we're spacing the seats and, you know, even have arrows on the floor, you know, you come in one door and go out the other door. I mean, I think all that's here to stay. And as far as in the hospital too, I mean, I guess the one thing this is, this this one thing this is makes look easier now is, you know, I used to complain when we had the MRSA patient that we had the gown and glove for. Now I look forward to that patient because I don't have to put on all the goggles and N95 and everything else. So uh, I think we are doing better hygiene now. I think uh, we pay more attention to washing hands and, and doing things we probably should have been doing for the past decade. And perhaps had we, we might not have found ourselves in quite the pickle we uh, found ourselves in. Hey, uh, Hanman, you want to you want to comment on stuff, especially what what Kojin was beginning to talk about. The yeah, can, can I, 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 Kojin, yeah. I, I absolutely agree that you know this uh, um, this was just ridiculous. Every every time we discuss this, we could get all the physicians together agreeing, uh, you know, that this is how we're going to do it. But then it, it was just like pulling teeth with with the hospital side to get anything, any kind of movement in a positive direction. Was that your experience or did it, uh, was, was, uh, you know, still, we, I could have every, we could have every doctor in the hospital agree this is how we want to do it. And we still would have to convince another hundred people and spend two weeks doing it. Yeah. I think that's just the nature of it. When you get to a certain tipping point of how many people you have to communicate and decide for, I think what we found with the biggest struggle is that, you know, we're relying on guidelines to help make some decisions and clearly yeah. none of it was really evidence-based, but it was coming from you know, the ACS or SAGES or whatever. And maybe within the surgical subspecialties, they were kind of aligned with some of the thoughts, but it wasn't in line with anesthesia. It wasn't in line with CHA or you know, AORN and all that. So I think that's where we struggle sometimes creating the policies and the procedures and trying to figure it out because everybody in the right way was following what their society or their organization was, was telling them to do. I think there needs to be a handbook, a universal handbook when this is all done. Uh, so that, you know, we don't have to reinvent. I think it's all kind of come together now, but it just takes time to kind of discuss through these things. And people are very passionate about what they feel and the fears. And, and I think, you know, for us as the surgeons, we always want to go, go, go. But my message to the surgeons was that, you know what, we, we're at risk. We take care of the COVID patients, but you know, there's nobody more at risk than anesthesia. They're the ones putting the patients to sleep, right? And so we do have to have a sensitivity to what they want to do. And so I think these are things that just part of growing pains in this experience. And everybody's gone through this. Everybody experienced it. Hey, Hanman, what's the right answer? How do you get consensus on, on this stuff? Challenging. Um, so just uh, uh, before I get into that, maybe just talk about things that I think have changed and has been expressed. I think telemedicine is here to stay. Uh, I think at the the early phase of COVID, something like 80% of our patients were being seen uh, via telehealth. And, and uh, I think obviously for surgical uh, patients, um, that's probably too many, but there are certainly things that we can follow up with and see with uh, telemedicine. So, and, and patients like it. And I think a lot of the, the surgeons like it too, because it's actually very efficient, uh, done well. I'll be really interested to see what flu season is like next year. You know, I, I suspect that we're going to have 
uh, less flu uh, patients because as everybody was mentioning, uh, hand hygiene and mask wearing is gonna be much better. I would agree that you know the convergence of all the societal inputs um, have been challenging, but uh, as you were saying, I think we are coming to sort of a consensus all around. Um, we, as far as I know, have not had any conversions while patients have been hospitalized by PCR analysis for swab testing. But, you know, when the, the asymptomatic uh, incidence increases, that's assuredly going to happen. I mean, there's just no way around it. Uh, it's going to happen in the hospital and out of the hospital. As far as policies around how do you get consensus, it's really interesting. We had, as you know, a recent scare where there may have been a mass exposure uh, that ended up not amounting to anything, but we had five or six meetings that all lasted about two hours. If you didn't know what specialty, uh, if you were just a complete outsider, you could guess what people were because they were surgeons, anesthesiologists, and then uh, basically medical people. The surgeons and the anesthesiologists, I would have to say, wanted to know all the branch points for the algorithms and what people thought that the decisions would be for each branch point so that there was going to be one or two meetings and we would have decisions and we would work off of that. The medical people wanted to build the algorithms, but then they wanted to get further data testing and then meet again and then create more algorithms that were basically the same algorithms. So, you know, it was sort of like Harry Potter and the sorting hat. Like you could tell whether somebody was in, I don't know, Slytherin, Slytherin slash surgery versus, uh, you know, whatever the other, um, you know, houses are slash internal medicine uh, just by what, you know, how they thought about it. Because they we're, we're, we have a bias towards action and they have a bias towards thinking. And that was, you know, very clear. And as Kojin was saying, though, you know, we have to function as, you know, with all of these different specialties. But I thought that was really, really interesting. Because the decision makers were by and large the ID people, you know, it was six or seven meetings that lasted two hours to make a decision. In the end, I think it was mostly good, but it took a lot of time. It did, and it invested a lot into it. So I, I think one other thing I would say is, is that, you know, one thing that I would love to see is mathematical modeling for a lot of these things, because I think a lot of the decision making around who should get tested and what uh, and when is really based on pretest probabilities and what the local incidence of asymptomatic positive is. Because, you know, when we were doing early testing, reports out of the West Coast were one in a thousand children preoperatively were asymptomatic and positive prior to surgery. Uh, if you compare that to like the OB experience in New York, where as many as 50% of the women delivering were asymptomatic and positive, you know, that has a huge impact on spread of the disease. And, you know, I think that that could be mathematically modeled because that affects what tests you're going to do and how reliable the tests are. Can you convince my, my, my people to go to that 10 day thing? Cause we're still like waiting two to three weeks and having to have negative tests. So wow, <laughs> uh, it's a struggle, you know, to change those policies. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm the kind of guy that, you know, uh, really wants to take a lot of input and have kind of group decision making. And that's kind of my my style. But I think through this thing, there are times where I said, you know, we just need to make a decision and right. go with it and not wait, you know, a week or two weeks and talk about it and uh, get another committee together and review it. Like things need to change quickly, you know, because I think one of the struggles is it, is just be able to communicate to everybody what needs to happen. And consistently, you know, not only your nurses, but your docs and your surgeons, but your residents and your trainees. And so then you create these confrontations where, oh, yeah, I can come back to work. But someone said that we have this change of policy. It hasn't really trickled down and we're talking about it. And, and so I think just like any big organization, you know, the ability to, to uh, effectively communicate and make decisions in a very nimble fashion uh, is challenging. I think people have learned how to hopefully do that a little bit better. 
Yeah, no, it's really interesting you bring this up, and I'm because I and I want Hyman to comment on this stuff as well because we've we've had similar frustrations and challenges, and it's a and it's a moving target of of what to do with the testing and the timing. Bob, I love the fact that you're so devoted to this panel that you got on, you got back on. Yeah. <laughs> the um, before you may have to go again. Any the question the question of the group was uh, permanent changes for. Um, you know, uh, patient practice and, you know, and, and have you had, you know, kids, you know, zero convert in the hospital and, you know, are, are all the things we we're doing now a new way of life? Yeah. Last report I heard was 20% here in Florida. Wow. So this is, it, the discussion is so amazing. And, uh, you know, and I think we could all passionately sit here for hours. Um, uh, we're, we're getting close to the end of our hour here. And I want to wrap up by let, letting Martha speak a little bit to the, the data collection in Google Sheets effort. This has been going on since, you know, since March, trying to get some kind of visibility on what, what does everybody do? And this is just sharing everybody's experience in some kind of tablet form, as Hanman was saying, trying to get scientific and mathematical about it, trying. Uh, so Martha, where, where do we stand with all of this? So first, I wanted to just say thank you for allowing me to be here, um, hearing all of your experiences. Thank you for sharing your experiences and your insight. We have learned so much during the first search from all of the institutions, adding in adding experiences, very much describing how COVID was impacting their hospital. We have created a second new sheet that has about 26 questions. Many of them focus on experiences with operating on COVID positive patients who may or may not have been asymptomatic, current decision making around scheduling elective cases, where hospitals are with their particular, with having a surge in the city um, or in their institution, and just kind of like how surgeons are able to address these issues um, now that completely banning elective surgery is not something that many of us want to do. We're hopeful that institutions will go back and um, provide their experiences on this new sheet. Um, again, primarily this is to help everyone see what everyone's various experiences are. And then we hope that we'll be able to produce another um, either podcast or publication or some sort of output to be able to very widely disperse this information with pediatric surgeons across America. So. And the access to the sheet is going to be up on the APSA website. So uh, at the very top, if you go to the COVID-19 tab that's on the not a textbook side, you'll see the link there to the to the sheet. And and hopefully the intent is to pull experiences just like what we've been talking about here, so that everybody can put in what's going on with the surge, where are we now, what's permanent. You know, they're great questions, and no one has the answer. And so maybe the best we can do is figure out what is national consensus. So I encourage everybody take a look at it and, and at the back end we want to make it visible uh, so that everybody can see what's going on. And then you can see prior versions of the data sheet as well under the quality and safety committee's Google Drive. It is listed in the COVID-19 folder and so links to both the viewability of the old data sharing document and then the new editable uh, data sharing document. Both of those are available. Great. Thank you, Martha. I think that's all we have, or at least all the time that we have. So um, uh, I'm going to wrap it up. And um, thank you so much, everybody. I, you know, um, I, it's you know we got we've gotten so many comments over the past few months about how meaningful it is to just share experiences, and um, and, and people really appreciate it. So uh, thanks, Bob. Go take care of your your uh, appy. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, let's see here. We're ready to roll. Great, let's go All to right. the OR with you. Yeah, come on. That might be a HIPAA violation.